These episode introductions are one of my least favorite parts about podcasting. Uh, I, the reality is I don't even need to do them. I don't know why. But I, I suppose I feel like I have to for some reason. I don't know. It's a good thing, right? Get some information out there. But usually I record them, you know, after the interview, long after the interview sometimes. Um, and a lot of times I sit in the van in the garage. And right now it is approximately 173 degrees inside the van. And the little introduction is usually anywhere from like three, four, five minutes long. So it's not very long. But the reality is I sit in the van for 10 or 15 minutes trying to record it because I sit and <laughs> pause in the middle of sentences because I don't know what I'm going to say. I have to go back and cut and edit and erase 90% of what is said. And maybe one day I'll do one without editing it, but it's terrible. Trust me, I don't think anybody wants to hear that. It's funny, but it's terrible. Having divulged, see, I just had to repeat that. Having divulged that wonderful information, thank you for listening to the Energy is Love podcast. Okay, before we go too much further, I want to talk about Everyman. E-V-R-Y-M-A-N dot C-O. Next month, actually this month, it's August. So in just a few weeks, they are leading a small expedition into Yellowstone National Park. It's a week-long thing. It's an amazing thing. Uh, just about this time last year, I went on the first Yellowstone expedition with Everyman. And it was a huge catalyst for life-changing everything, basically. <laughs> Essentially, my life going from one area to a completely different area in all the areas. So that's why I will talk about every man, every opportunity I get. But they have another one that's coming up in just a few weeks. Same thing, they're going to be going into Yellowstone. It's a week-long thing, like I said. It's an amazing experience for the men that get the opportunity to go. The only difference is this one is specifically focused for veterans. So they're basically splitting the group of men that they're taking. Half will be return veterans, special forces guys that have come back, and the other half will just be regular everyday dudes. The whole idea is providing this space, this opportunity, this experience out into the Yellowstone National Park, which is beautiful by the way, and giving these men a place where they can integrate back into society with regular every guy, everyday guys, but then also do this deep work that every man focuses on. So it's incredible. It's amazing. Um, the reason I bring it up, the reason I'm talking about it, is because you have the opportunity to help. Now granted, if you want to go and participate, get to their website, find their information, go do that. You can obviously participate with every man in everything that they do, right? They've got some retreats coming up the later, uh, later this year that I know of. You can start your own men's group like I did last year. Lots of different ways. Uh, go listen to Dan's podcast. It's just the Everyman podcast. But this specifically, you can help by donating to this expedition that they're hosting in just a few weeks up in Yellowstone. They are raffling off a motorcycle. So every ticket that's purchased for that raffle will go directly to that experience and supporting the men in that space. So that's why I bring it up, because it's a good opportunity for you to give back a little bit. And at the same time, you get the chance to win a sweet kick-ass motorcycle. So the easiest way, I think, would be to go to our Facebook page, just the Energies Love Podcast. Uh, we've posted and shared it on there. You can go and find it. Also, if you just go to Everyman's Facebook page, remember it's E-V-R-Y-M-A-N. Same thing. You'll be able to find all the links, all the information, and then go do it. Go share, go tag somebody, go donate, right? We threw in some money. By we, I mean my wife and I. And just go do it. I highly recommend it. Okay, new episode of the podcast with Craig Lemire. So I'm definitely a fan of Craig's, not just because of his incredible name, but my brother turned me on to his work several, several years ago, and ever since then I've followed him on social media, I've checked out his work, I've gone to his website, all those kind of different things, and I just love the pictures that this man takes. He's an incredible artist, he's an incredible photographer, and he does great work. Part of the reason why I wanted to talk to him, part of the reason why I wanted to have him on the, uh, have him on the podcast was because he's got an incredible story as well. Craig is 48 years old, and he talks about this during the episode, but he didn't start taking pictures. He wasn't 
a photographer his whole life. This wasn't what he thought he was going to be when he grew up. He didn't start until he turned 40. So it's an inspirational story in the sense that like (laughs) at any point and phase in your life, you can change. You can find what your passion is. You can find what you're really good at. And Craig's a wonderful example of that. So it was a lot of fun. Great interview. I drove up to Pocatello, where Craig is based out of, and we recorded in his studio. So the whole time we were surrounded by his work, which was really awesome to kind of sit and listen to him, but then also get a look up on the walls and see all the amazing photographs that he's taken over the years. CraigLemire.com. You can also go follow him on Facebook, Instagram. He's pretty active on social media, sharing and posting and things like that. So it's a great way to check out his work. And as always, we've got all those links in the show notes. But for now... Just sit back and enjoy. It's a great episode with a incredible artist, amazing man. Thank you, Craig. Here we go. You're listening to the Energy is Love podcast. Energy is love. The Energy is the Love podcast. The Energy is Love podcast. Energy is love. The Energy is Love podcast. The podcast for the universe. The Energy is Love podcast. Oh. <laughs> I was so fucking rushed to get here. Like, it was funny. I was, um, woke up this morning cause I'm super excited to fucking talk to you, man. Thank you. And, um, so I've been wanting to do this and wanting this to happen. And I woke up this morning and I was talking to my wife and, and then finally we were able to connect and I'm like, Oh fuck, I gotta, I gotta get ready. I gotta get in the car. And then I start fucking flying up here, but I'm very, very grateful. Thank you very much. For oh, your time. thank you. Sorry. I've, I'm going a jillion miles everywhere. <laughs> so crazy. It feels like I'm going so fast and accomplishing dick. Yeah. It's like, fuck. It's spinning in circles sometimes, oh, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I get that feeling too. I get that a lot where it feels like you have this huge to-do list and it almost just continues to grow as you get shit done. And then it's like nothing ever gets done. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I have have to like force myself to sit at home and be home long enough that I can mow my lawn and like just get the simplest, easiest things done and off my list. Like the other day I took the time, it was like two, three hours where I cleaned the car, vacuumed everything, you know, wiped off everything on the inside and then washed the outside of it. And it's just like this great sense of accomplishment over the littlest, tiniest thing. Hey, I hear you. I do my dishes. I'm just like, yeah, that's pretty good. (laughs) So... One of the things, because I, I have a handful of questions that I kind of want to ask you and I want to talk about, but one of the first things that I always talk about and I ask everybody on the podcast right off the bat, it's kind of a shitty, difficult question, but the reason I do it is because I like the idea that people out there listening, uh, hopefully in some way, shape or form, it changes their perspective about things and kind of changes the conversation as a whole, even in just the smallest, little sense, right? Because it's just on a podcast that somebody listens to down the road. But the question is, first off, I think that everybody struggles uh, throughout our lives in one way, shape, or form with mental balance and suffering from some sort of mental issue. And so I always ask people, like, what issue do you have when it comes to your mental health? Whether it's obvious and, you know, you've been diagnosed with something or if it's more subtle. But I think that space where people just straight up struggle day-to-day normal life and have periods of time where we may swing to one end of the spectrum or the other, but our mental health, our mental balance, our mental well-being, because I think there's such a negative stigma attached to like mental illness and things like that. Yeah. So can you think of anything? Like I said, I know it's kind of like a... <laughs> oh, oh, is this... Is, are you asking me right now? Yeah. Oh, um, I would definitely say I have mental issues. <laughs> uh I think that um, I'm a very rational person. I didn't really used to be. I was a really bad hothead. Um, I think that uh, to the good and the bad, I, I live in my head more than anywhere. Um, so I read this article a long time ago. It was called The Duality of the Creative. And it pretty much talked about how creative people are introverted and extroverted and that, that, you know, where we run really kind of from one end of the spectrum to the other. 
And so for me, um, you know, I have a, I have a, like an, it's still a hundred percent me, but it's definitely like an online social media me. And then there's a, a different me that people really don't, unless you're in my little circle, really know. And even when you're in my little circle, you don't really know, you know, like, uh, um, I'm a sh- super huge daydreamer. Like I, I constantly daydream, like I'm in fantasy land all the time. And, uh, I play these little movies in my head and, uh, uh, that's why music is so important to me is because, you know, the songs that I listen to are the soundtracks of the things that are running through my head. Like I literally have movies in my head. And so, you know, and then, and so a lot of times looking back, what really is going on isn't really how I perceive things. You know, I, per- I'm a super positive person and I believe that, you know, things will always work out. There's always a way they might not work out the way you want them to work out, but they're going to work out like there's no complete end. Um, and so a lot of times I'll get caught in my own head of, how to solve these things or how to not solve these things and how you're going to deal with these things. And, and so, um, do you have an example of like something that, you know, looking back now, cause hindsight, we can always see shit much clearer. Do you have something that you can look back and say, you know, I was hoping it would turn out this way, but in the long run, it turned out this way and it turned out to be much better, right? It all worked out in the end. Um, I don't know if anything worked out a lot better. Um, let me see. What would I think of? Um, mostly, mostly I really get my head when I'm in trouble more than, <laughs> more than when I'm like having good times. Yeah. You know, I, uh, you know, I, I, I'm very cognizant of my decisions, you know, and, and a lot of times I'll make decisions based on consequence. And so then if it doesn't work out, you know, I, I'm a big bet maker you know you you know bet big win big but then you know if you bet wrong you're gonna really be in a lot of trouble and i'm okay with that because I, I made those decisions and so for me i learned so much from my lessons but my lessons cost me tons of money and tons of heartache you know at times yeah they come at a high price yeah but then on the other side of it when you win the the winning isn't you've already for me i've already taken it into account the win because that's what I made the bet. So when you do bet and you win, you know, it's not super exhilarating, you know, because I planned on winning. I never planned on not losing. But when you do choose wrong, then I've prepared myself enough that it isn't like monumental kill me type deal, you know. And I'd say on the mental health thing, one thing that's kind of really sobered me up is – um uh like with all these people killing themselves, you know, um, like I love Chris Cornell. Like I, I freaking love Chris Cornell. And then, you know, he kills himself, you know, and then I, I loved Anthony Bourdain, you know, two dudes that like really, you know, I don't, this doesn't sound really terrible, but I don't admire a lot of people. I am just not built that way. Like I, I like them and I appreciate what they do, but I, I don't really have people that I put on pedestals. Mm-hmm. And, but those guys were people like who I really, to a degree, aspired to be. I mean, I would never be like Chris Cornell because I could never, but if I, I always told myself, go, gosh dang it, like if I could sing, <laughs> like that's who I would want to sound like. Like, like his voice to me was perfection in a voice and I'm, 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 I'm really, I don't know if I'm a perfectionist, but, um, I do everything to win, to be the very best. I don't, that doesn't mean I'm perfect. That means that I will be the best. And so for me, listening to him sing, that was that to me, that's the best voice that a, that a guy could ever sound was him. And so I'm like, cool. And then, like, with Anthony Bourdain, you know, 
watching him and, and how he spoke about things and his passion for life and his passion for the food and, you know, and how he brought in, you know, kind of the local flavor of all the places he went, you know, as I got older and was able to travel like I can now, he was like, that's what I aspire to do. Like, I was like, dang it, man, that's how I want to travel. That's how I want to see the world. Like, yeah, I want to see the touristy things, but I, I want it to mean something, you know, and for me, you know, he seemed super honest in the way he met people and super honest in the way he enjoyed food. And I, you know, and so it's like guys that are really in like <clears throat> embracing life. Right. And kind of like open about their shit to a certain extent and feel like, I think they both put forth this thing of, um, that they were okay with who they were and they owned it to a certain extent. And then, like you said, like had a zest and like really, you know, appreciated the finer things in life and the small things in life, the things that, you know, too often we just kind of brush apart, brush past and don't really recognize. Exactly. But then, you know, there must've been something in them that, you know, and I have my own little hypothesis on it is that, you know, it was, you know, you can have everything in the world, but if you don't have anyone to share it with, there's no point to it. Yeah. Like, and I think it was, you know, that loneliness that something was in them that was missing. That, that, that like I said, they, they, they wanted for nothing, but there was something that they didn't get. And I think that, you know, going back to that mental state business, like with me, you know, I'm, um, I'm surrounded, you know, I'm, I'm so lucky and blessed to have the following that I have. And I appreciate every single person. Um, but there would be to me, um, like acquaintances, you know, and, and, and not, I get, you know, I, I probably have five friends. Yeah. That I would consider like my legit friends. And I have and I have two people on earth that like if and I tell everyone it sounds terrible, but you know, if, if I did something real bad, like let's say I killed someone, I know two people that would go dig the hole. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> and, and everyone else that wouldn't happen. And so, you know, for myself, I get caught up in my head and, and like with everything that's happened with me, it's been amazing, but there's been a lot of um loneliness to it, you know, and, and that'll get that'll that loneliness will eat your ass alive like like I, I think it's the for me anyway the loneliness is probably by far the most destructive force in my life like there's not even anything close like um i'm super competitive you know everyone knows before i got into photography i was a football coach you know and we just kicked the shit out of the whole world you know and then everything i do you know, it sounds terrible, but I've been pretty successful at everything I ever did. Um, and I've been pretty successful at this. But, you know, there's lots of periods of time in this thing that it just, it, it, it should have been more probably because I didn't have, you know, I was, I was alone. But I mean, but you're not alone. You know what I mean? Like, like mm -hmm. it's, so, it's so weird to sound like, like I said, I, you know, there's thousands and thousands of people that, that follow my, you know, social media and that, that are always so kind to comment on my pictures and this and that, you know, I go to the different conventions and, you know, it's, it's very surreal that people come up and shake your hand and just want to take your picture and meet you and say such nice things to you about, you know, what your art does or what your attitude, you know, does for them. And, and that, like I said, I appreciate all that stuff, but. You know, there's a point when you're completely alone. And like I said, it's that, it's that loneliness that there's no answer for. Like, 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 I mean, you could, you could have all the money in the world and you could win, you know, all the prizes and have all the accolades, but that's the one thing that, that you can't beat. Yeah. Like there's always that moment, right? Where <clears throat> undoubtedly at the end of the day, you're going to come back and have some experience. You're going to have some moment in time when you're alone, like you're by yourself. Right. And, and that's when everything for me personally, like that's when shit gets loud is, you know, when I do have those moments in time, like I'm married, um, I've got kids, I've got, you know, a relatively busy life for the most part. 
where I'm constantly kind of doing things and then I'll have these moments and like just recently, like in the last, like this week I had this realization, um, cause I travel a lot and so I've been home for a little bit, which has been really nice. And my wife was out doing stuff, right? She's got her own life. She's doing her own shit and everything like that. And she was taken off to go do stuff. And I was sitting home and my kids were home even, but they're like, you know, teenagers and they have their own lives and they're doing their own shit stuff. And, and I had this moment where I realized like suddenly I was alone and suddenly I was lonely. And it was really, really hard to kind of identify what the feeling was inside of me because like I could feel I was starting to get depressed. I was starting to get frustrated. Um, typically like my go-to if I'm bored or depressed or lonely is I just start fucking eating and suddenly I was like watching a movie and eating this big bowl of ice cream. And I'm like, what are you doing? Like, why am I doing this right now in this moment? It's like, oh, I'm really just lonely. And it's silly because I'm surrounded by people that love me and that I love. And do you know what I mean? I have friends and I have all these things. But um, yeah, that loneliness thing is a bitch because <laughs> yeah. it doesn't go anywhere. It's just quiet waiting in the background for its opportunity to kind of rear its ugly head at times. Yeah, it's crazy. Like that's, yeah, it's nuts, mm -hmm. you know, but I mean, yeah, I don't know what else to say other than like that, that would probably be the, as far as, you know, mental stuff, I think that, that probably gets me the most. Everything else is like nothing. Like I don't, I, you know, I don't, I don't freak out on things. I don't sweat things. I, you know, and as far as like life goes, I, I think I could beat it. Yeah. You know, that's. Um, I don't know. <laughs> so what do you do? What do you do? Like when you feel, when you feel that thing come up, right? When you start feeling that experience or that feeling, uh, do you have awareness of it or is it always hindsight when you can look back? No, it's like, it's awareness. It's almost like panic attack for me. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when, when loneliness really hits me, I mean, it just like, I get crazy thoughts, you know? And then you just, for me, it's just, I don't really have a go-to other than you just get through it. You know what I mean? Like, like in just kind of sit back and look at yourself and self-assess and just like, okay, it's, it's a feeling, you know? And, and I guess a little bit of it is pity party. Woe is me. And then I, you know, a lot of times I think, well, fuck, look at my life. Like <laughs> <laughs> I have no reason to, to feel like that, but, but you can't, you can't help how you feel at times. Yeah. Everybody I think feels that too, right? Like that's yeah. why people, like we were talking earlier, like Anthony Bourdain and these people that, you know, who on the outside look like they have it all, who are living the dream, living their life the way that they want to be living it. Like undoubtedly, they still have those moments where they have that little pity party where they're like, fuck, man. Yeah. Or, or, even, or worse, man, you know, because I don't, I'm not really like, I don't, you know, I don't, thank goodness, you know, I don't turn to booze or drugs or anything to to try to cope i i, I really don't have a, a coping thing you know i don't eat to make myself feel better i just it just that's just where i'm at at that time you know um and then you just get through it and it's just mm, this probably sound crazy <laughs> but like and and through this thing, holy people are really gonna think I'm super fucked up, which I really am. Like if like if people really knew me, I'm I'm a mess. But but that's the like that's why I like talking about this in the beginning because the fact is everybody's super fucked up, right? We all sit back and think that the grass is always greener and everybody else always has their shit together, and I'm the fucked up one. And in reality, everybody that I talk to, everybody that I connect with, everybody struggles in a lot of these similar areas. So we're all fucked up at the end of the day. But nobody thinks about that, right? We always think it's just us. Like we're so unique in our own little problems. Yeah. Penny party stuff. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. It's um like you're no more you're no more fucked up than me. And obviously you're no more fucked up than the people that you encounter, but it's stuff that we don't talk about and it's stuff that we don't really want to share because I think of like, you know, we're ashamed of it. We don't want to bring forth this weakness or what may be perceived as a weakness when in reality it's just all the same stuff that we all deal with. Yeah. Well, it's really crazy because, like I said, when, when those guys are doing what they did, and I've been talking to a lot of people about it, it's really amazing how many people uh, out in the world really are that way. Like, loneliness is like, I, I mean, I've been really fixated on it lately. Not 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 that so much that I am lonely because I have little pockets of it, but just how prevalent and powerful it is, you know? So, because... Uh, 
I guess the older I get, the more, you know, the older you get, the more you, you look at different things and you look at the world differently. You know, like, uh, you know, people always say, oh, my 20s were the greatest or my 30s were the greatest or this or that. Like, I always say, you know, every stage is great, but for different reasons. Like, like I couldn't go, like, I'm kind of a late bloomer, you know, in the things that I've done and the things that I've found. And there's certain things that... um like I'm, I'm gonna, I'm forty. I'm gonna be forty-eight in twenty days, but mentally I'm probably twenty. Yeah, you know, and 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 so a lot of times I, I think that, you know, I want to go do those things that because I didn't do them when I was twenty. You know, I didn't have certain experiences, but those that window's closed. Like you can't go back and do those things. Just like if you were in your twenties or thirties, you couldn't appreciate what's happening now. Oops, with a uh, it, you know, unless you're in your forties, you know, I mean, everything's different. And so just how you appreciate things and look at things, I think is, is a lot different. Yeah, for sure. I remember thinking <clears throat> like my oldest daughter right now, she's 19 years old. Right. And I remember very well what it was like when I was 19, what I thought, what I felt like how confident I was, how, how I thought that I knew everything and that I had my life squared away and I had my big plan for the future and all these different things. And every stage in my life that just gets like completely like hammered, right? Like, fuck, I was so stupid and so naive and so ignorant. But then the next phase comes along and I'm like, okay, I'm much better now. I'm much more solid in my thought process and where I'm currently at in life and much more, you know, at peace with the situations. And then the next phase will come along and be like, oh, you were even fucking dumber then. And now um, how I'm 37 and I feel much more squared away and much more like knowledgeable and like at peace with myself and with my life. But also like, I feel like I have way more wisdom than I did even five years ago. But with that wisdom, I also am completely aware of the fact that like 10 years from now, when I'm in your shoes, I'm going to look back and be like, man, I was so fucking stupid. <laughs> like, there's so much more that comes at every phase of life. And I like what you said where, you know, you're 20 years old, you don't get a fast forward and enjoy what it's like to be 40. Like that time hasn't come yet. You don't get to experience it because you're not going to be, even if you did, you're not going to really fucking appreciate it or recognize it. You can't. No. <laughs> and it sucks, right? It would be nice to be able to go back. It'd be nice to be able to go back and kind of relive or uh, go through some of the experiences that you feel like you missed out on. Well, yeah. I mean, it's really interesting with me because uh, I shoot, you know, you know, I have my regular client base, uh, you know, but then for my portfolio work, you know, I'm always, I'm always, you know, shooting younger people, obviously. And uh, so, you know, listening to their experience and the things that, you know, that they you know, have on a horizon, you know, or them traveling and what they do and this and that, you know, and you're just going, dang, man, that sounds so fun, you know, but that, it's like you said, that's not, that, even as much as I wish I could have done that because I didn't do that, you know, you just can't go back and do that, you know. Yeah. But, but then again, you know, you know, they just talk about all their partying and stuff and you're just going, you know, partying's nice and all, but, and you're, you know, you're missing out on so much that's so amazing beyond just being drunk and you know fucked up that you, you don't see anything but that yeah like you said it just comes with age like you can't go back and you can't move forward so i think it's super important to like live li you know live in the moment you know you know learn from your mistakes in the past and 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 live for now and you know and do a little bit of planning for the future because the future will come i mean i see this every year but 2018 legitimately is the fastest year in the history of my existence. <laughs> like, I cannot believe it's August right now. Yeah. I'm just going, you know, when you blink, like, I don't know how it is for you, but, you know, I blink and a decade's gone. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and now, as I, like, says I'm getting older, and especially with photography, like, I didn't take a picture until I was 40. Um, and what a lot of people don't know is, you know, I, before I was 40, I had never been past the Denver airport in my whole life. You know, I, I went to Tijuana once for spring break, and I don't know if that counts, but when I got that camera, the whole world opened up to me, you know, and just by shit-ass luck. And so, you know, since then, in this past, you know, almost eight years now, um, 
you know, I've been almost every state, been all over the world. Uh, I'll continue to go all over the world and see these things. And uh, um, it just, it's just been crazy amazing. Like, does that just blow your mind? Do you know what I mean? Because that's one thing I wanted to talk to you about, because I think <clears throat> I know a little bit about your story and it's just from gleaming it from like your website and from following you on social media and things like that. But what was it like to have this thing that you've created at this point in your life and the way that it has changed your life so massively come at such a later point, right? Well, because <laughs> uh, you didn't, you didn't, um, like this wasn't something that you aspired to in a oh, sense. Oh no, I, I felt if so, it's so weird, it, you know, things happen. I, I think I'm a big believer in, you know, I'm a big romantic dude, like too much. Like I, <laughs> I, I believe in fate and I believe in destiny. I believe in all that stuff. Soulmates, all that crap. Um, but literally if Costco doesn't open in our town, this doesn't exist. You know, if my, if my wife at the time doesn't, if my wife at the time found a job in our town, we're not having this conversation, like never, you know? And so like I said, I, I was in insurance and I needed a, a, an outlet. And so Costco opened and I bought a little rebel camera and that changed my life. You know, I, I got in photography, I was coaching football still. And so all I thought about was being a good photographer in Pocatello, shooting family pictures and shooting seniors. And then when Stacy graduated, she couldn't find a job here. So we had to move her two hours away to a different city. I had nothing to do. So I started screwing around trying to be a fashion photographer and a boudoir photographer. And from there is where everything blew up. And so, you know, I never had a plan in my life. Like I'm not like, um, those, those people who like have their whole life planned or it's amazing to me. You know, I, 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 I never aspire to be anything in my life. Like it just wasn't my plan. Like I just wanted to have fun. And I, I always knew I would be successful at whatever I did. Like I, I just knew it. But I never, like when I was a kid, I said, oh, I want to be a doctor. Oh, I want to be a lawyer. You know, I, I didn't have any direction and drive when I was young. And then when I got into insurance, well, what really gave me the most direction was coaching. You know, coaching football gave me the most direction and, and gave me my purpose and really set everything up for what was coming later. And then photography, like I said, I got good at what I was doing and then I found Facebook. And that's Facebook is what changed my whole life because then, you know, these photographers that have these groups, you know, everyone follows them and then you put your pictures in their group. And then what happened for me, which was super lucky, was I'd put my pictures in their group on their theme days or whatever. And then other people would go start to like the pictures. And then a couple of years in, they started asking, oh, do you teach? And I'm, it never even dawned on me. I didn't even know that part of this thing existed. And then I decided to do it once and then it all kind of opened up. Did you just start in the beginning? You said you needed an outlet. <clears throat> like what part of your... Like, where were you at in your life where you realized, like, oh, shit, I need something else, right? I need a hobby or something. Well, um, you know, I put myself through school being a graphic artist, you know, so I'd always had that graphics background, but I'd never taken pictures. But mm -hmm. I, I had, a, you know, probably the number one reason why I was able to do what I've done in the time I've done is, is that I, I had such a big Photoshop background, you know. Um, and so... I, I just wanted to start taking pictures and do anything to be creative because I, I hated insurance that much. And that was it. Like it, that was just, I'm just going to buy a camera. I'm going to take some pictures and it just took over. Like, uh, you know, I'm self-taught, you know, I, I would go when I was done knocking doors, cold calling, go to Barnes and Noble and read books, get on YouTube and look at videos and just, I mean, just practice and practice and practice. And, it was just so fulfilling and amazing to, how would I put it? Okay, so a lot of it, I kind of digressing. You know, one of the things that, one of the things that I kind of, 
hard for me to hear from a lot of photographers, especially, you know, a lot of new photographers is they're so down on themselves. You know, I think one of the things that, that really screws people up is comparing yourself to other people. Mm -hmm. Like it's the, probably the num number one worst thing that you could do. Well, the number one worst thing you can do is put your pictures in these stupid Facebook groups and ask people for <laughs> critiques of your work. Like, because every dumbass who has something to say is shitty. Yeah. You know, but anyway, um, I never, you know, I never got to that phase. I never compared myself to anyone. I would look at people's work. I mean, like nothing's new. That's the other thing that photographers, it's really interesting. Really shitty photographers and medium shitty photographers have all this idea of how photography is supposed to work. And they have no idea. And how art is supposed to work and they have no idea. You know, shitty photographers and medium shitty photographers have it in their head that they're actually inventing something. Yeah. You know, that, that <laughs> their location they found is is should only be shot by them or that this pose that they've done is theirs. And they're too stupid to know that, hey, dumbass, you know. That shit's been posed and shot uh, before you were even, you know, a gleam in your parents' eyes. Yeah. You know, every pose has been done, not on, not photographed, but painted before. And so, like, I would look at people's work and I would admire it, but I never, you know, and obviously to agree there's, there's copying, you know, I mean, you're going to do that when you, when you're new, you're going to say, oh, I like the way that looks. I'm going to try to get to that point. But there was no one that I like was ever jealous of. And then as my work progressed, like it's, I kind of did it backwards. Like I, I, in the beginning, I thought I was so awesome. And I think I'm less awesome now. <laughs> like in the beginning, I thought I was such a fucking amazing photographer. And when I go back and look at my shitty pictures, I'm just like, I'm not, I, I actually love them. Like I love going back and looking at my old work and I love how horrible I was because where I am now, that means I put a lot of work in. Yeah. And that, that for me, I, I've earned where I'm at and I, and I'm, I'm very self-aware of where, what I do sits against all my peers and I'm good with it, mm -hmm. you know? And I, I never, I never doubted myself and I never got down on myself. Like, I still take shitty pictures. Like, like, you know, I'll practice or, or I'll have a, a, a paid session, you know, with clients and I'll, I'll take crappy pictures, you know, and I, I don't, you know, when you see these people on Facebook, oh, please, someone say something nice about my pictures or, oh my gosh, I just, I just got to get out of this thing. You know, well, get out. You know, I've said this a billion times, a billion different other uh, places, but, you know, photography is for everybody. Everyone should be able to pick up a camera or their phone and, and, and create images. But being a professional photographer and a business owner isn't for everybody. You know, just because you own a camera doesn't make you a professional photographer. Just because someone bought your shitty, ugly pictures doesn't make you a professional photographer. You know, and I'm, I'm really hard on that. I think that, you know... You know, I... I, I I used to speak all over the place. I go to all the guilds, you know, professional photographers of, of Maine or Idaho or Texas or Florida or whatever. And what was really astounding to me was the lack of knowledge in the professionals. Um, you know, we have rules to what we do. You know, there's artistic rules. Um, and it's amazing to me how many people <clears throat> don't know them and how many people don't have the basics of, of, of photography or composition or lighting, you know, and I, I, that's like one of the things that's probably is hard for me is that I just think that, you know, I love what I do so much and I love photography so much that I think that you're doing photography a disservice if you are not a great person studier of the rules and understand the basics like i have no problem with you breaking rules like you know i i think you should break the rules go experiment do all these things but if you break rules and don't know you're breaking a rule then that's wrong you know um why do you think that is do you think it's just people's like naivety where they don't really you know take the time or the energy to learn the craft of it and recognize it or is it just like 
like people just thinking, like you said, that they're recreating the will, right? Like they're doing something brand new, so they don't necessarily need to concern themselves with. Well, I, I think it's, I, I mean, it's a combination of things, you know, one of them is, and this is a good thing and a bad thing, like, you know, it's, so, you know, I had a salon in my studio and, and so my beautician, I mean, she had to jump through a million hoops to get her license to be able to put color in people's hair and do all this stuff. You know, with our trade, you just have to buy a camera. Like, there's no rules to it. You know, there's no standards. You know, one of the things that's kind of funny is, you know, throughout the professional ranks, people are always bitching and crying and saying, oh, this person's doing this and blah, blah, blah. But there's no accreditation. I mean, there's a few things you can get, but they don't really hold water. I yeah. Mean, I mean, they're just kind of there for the sake of being there. You know, and I, I think in, until photography has rules like other professions do, that it's always going to lack that because, you know, it's kind of the, that, you know, what comes first, the chicken or the egg kind of thing. You know, are you a professional because you're proficient at a certain level or are you a professional because someone buys your work? You know, and, and until there's set rules and standards, that's a question that cannot be answered. I mean, you can have your opinion on it, just like religion. You can tell me that this church is right or that church is right, but fuck, until you're dead, you're not going to know if you're right, <laughs> yeah. right? And it's the same way with photography. Like, until there's, you know, set uh, accreditations, then, you know, you can do what you want. You know, and then the other thing that kind of drives me crazy is, you know, this whole, oh, it's my art. It's my art. Well, your art looks like dog shit. You know, your art makes no fucking sense at all. You broke, you know... Like I said, it's a different thing to me if, if, if you if you know everything. Like, I guess I'd put it like this. Like, you know, you look at the, impress the impressionistic artists. And, I, you know, before, you know, you, I look at their work and I go, this is just horse shit. Like some little kid could splash this there and splash that there and boom, it's art. But then when you look at those dudes, you know, their work has progressed from X. Like those guys could do anything like they could i mean they are amazing but this is where their art is taking them they just didn't start out doing x if that makes sense mm -hmm. you know and and i think that's one of the things that that's kind of lacking in our industry is that you know and i and I, on my case is a little different too like I, I was really blessed because of the insurance side of things like when I mean, what's cool is that everyone can be a photographer. You know, that's the cool part. Well, one of the sad things is, is that when a lot of people, and I would say at least 90% of people, when they decide to go into professional photography, have to chase dollars and they have to chase clients. And what happens is when you do that, you never become an artist. You're a photographer. You're, you're a picture taker. Yeah. And so for me... I was really blessed because when I got out of what I was doing, I had a big enough bank account that I didn't have to chase clients, that I could just shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot and turn into the artist that I am now. And I didn't have to worry about money at the time, which is crappy because I went through all my money and now I'm on the other side of it. You know, I, I have a specific style and, you know, I'm at a certain proficiency level, but now I'm having to do the other side of it more. Like, because I, I quit teaching and speaking for the most part, and which was a good part of my income. And so now I have to, you know, I, I've reverted back to my insurance days now. Like I, I go cold call. Like I just, I go literally go knock doors. And people like, you know, when you're knocking doors on insurance, everyone hates your ass. They're like, you're the worst person in the world, right? <laughs> yeah. Which I understand. But what's interesting about cold calling with photography is people have never seen people cold call for photography. Photographers don't go knock doors, you know, and so it's an e it's easy. And it's something that people want, you know. And, and for me, when I'm cold calling, it's all, it's all commercial stuff. Like I don't, I don't do like family portraits and stuff because that's not going to go over your going in someone's business saying, hey, I'm a family portrait artist. I just want to look at my work. I don't have time for that shit. Yeah. But when you go in and you're just like, hey, you know what I specialize in? I specialize in X, you know, and, and 
they've never had anyone come to that. And it's something that they need because everyone needs that because that's the world we're in now. You know, it's kind of good now. Like everyone needs certain types of photography because we're in such a, a visual world now, you know? And so anyway, do you think there was a point, <clears throat> um, like, was there a point when you were taking pictures in the beginning and you're starting out and then suddenly you started to get to like this, um, sweet spot where you would take a picture and even before you had the chance to look at it again, right? Even before you pull the camera away and you look at the image on the back of the camera or whatever, where you took it and you're like, fuck, that's a good picture. Like you started to recognize and know when you were taking pictures, when they were going to be good pictures, okay pictures, or like a shitty picture. Um, I don't know exactly when the time is, but, every, but I mean, it's, it's, I tell every, you know, this is one of the things I really, I really stress when I'm teaching. Is I believe that before, just like you said, before you ever touch that button, even before you put that camera in your hand, 95% you should know what your picture is going to look like based off of certain criteria. So like how I do it now, um, and it's just ingrained in me, you know, a lot of, a lot of photographers don't meet their clients until the day they're, they're taking it. But I, I, I need to meet you before we shoot because... And this goes back to football stuff and preparation is that, so if I was going to shoot you, uh, we would meet and I'd start out with just like regular chit chat talk. And from that regular chit chat talk, I would be the whole time I'm sizing you up for our shoot. You know, I'd find out real quick, fast in a hurry. If you're a naturally smiley person or if you're a more stoic person, find out if your skin's shitty or if your skin's good. Find out if your nose is big or it wasn't big. If your eyes are recessed or they're not recessed. I'd find out, you know, are you a casual dresser? Are you not a casual dresser? You know, are you a sloucher? Are you this? Are you that? Because all those things are going to go into the recipe of how to create images for you. Like if you're a pretty chill, casual guy, then I know I can do X. You know, if you have really shitty skin, well, I know that, well, I can't Rembrandt light you. I can't split light you. Um, you know, I'm going to have to do something else because we have to minimize those flaws. You know, if I'm shooting a girl and I meet her and her eyes are really recessed, well, butterfly lighting is not going to be the greatest lighting for her because you can be raccoon eye. And by the time I get that light down far enough to get light in those eyes, it's fucking flat light. So I'm going to probably loop light her because that's the best go-to. Oh, she's thicker in her waist than she is here. Well, I know that probably going to have to shoot her a little bit more straight on. Oh, she has a great smile, and that's what she does. Okay, cool. So we're not going to shoot real edgy light because she's going to smile. It's going to fuck up the light patterns. So all of that stuff goes into the equation of shooting, going back to what you said. Before I do this or even pick this up, doing this, I already know what your picture is going to look like. You know, um, and I don't know when it happened because it's been so long now, and I'm sure <laughs> that, you know, there was a time... I mean, because when you shoot, you don't, the number one thing I tell everyone through this is, is, you know, you just have to be able to see things. That's the most important thing of photography is you just have to be able to see things, not look at stuff, but see it. You know, when people get confused about artificial light or natural light, you know, it's easy, man. Just step back and see the light. It's not hard. Like, like I think a lot of photographers overcomplicate things thinking, well, I got to do this. I got to do that. Put them here. Put them this. This light has to be at 45, blah, blah, all this bullshit. And then they don't see things. They're too busy doing what they think they're supposed to technically do. Instead of they just step back and just looked, they would see their picture. And once you see the picture, then that 5% variance and some things that you have to do that, that you couldn't account for you know, your shoot. Dude, that has to come with, because as you're describing it, right, the way that you would size somebody up in the beginning, right, and want to start getting some of those pieces that you need for the work that you're about to do, like my, listening to you describe it, like it's plain as fucking day. Like that's the difference from the guy that's a photographer and that's the difference from the guy that's an artist, right? That's the leap where you go from, yeah, I'm a photographer and I'm going to take these pictures and I know what I need to do and I need to, you know, pose people this way and all these kind of little different techniques and tricks to being able to just like, because my guess is you probably subconsciously in some way, shape or form probably do that with everybody now where you meet them and you're kind of in that process of like, oh, I would, you know, oh, this person I would shoot this way or, dude, you know. So I'm single. 
and I love girls. <laughs> and, but when I see, when I, because that, I, you know, I, oh, I love shooting any human. And, and I, I do, like when I meet people, that's the first thing I think about is, is literally shooting them. And when I see women, like when I see women, a lot of guys, most guys, when I see women, they see their boobs, they see their ass. First thing I see is hair. Like hair is the most important thing to me on earth. Like, like when I'm shooting, like, uh, you know, to me, when, when you're, when you're doing a shoot, whether it's a practice shoot or a regular shoot, hair is the most important. The makeup is for me far secondary because you could have someone like you could have a girl or a lady or whatever with the greatest makeup on the world. And if she has flat, shitty, terrible hair, your fucking pictures suck. But if you have someone that has this amazing hair, full of life, all this kind of stuff, really badass, and her makeup's just okay, your pictures are going to be badass. And so when I look at people, when I look at women, I see their hair first. Like I go, okay, so she has real thin hair, so we have to work that up. Or we're going to have to do this. Shit, she has real thin hair. So if the wind comes, man, we're going to have flyaways all over the place. Can't really do that. Or, oh, my gosh, her hair is really, has really thick. We could really make it giant, a lot of volume and this and that. So I'll see the hair. And then I'll see the, I'll look at the eyes. You know, the eyes are the next most important thing to me. Um, and then after that, uh, I'll see her waist and her ass and then the rest. But for me, I, like, it's that, it's that hair. And the same, you know, with guys too, it's more about their jawline, um, their nose. Um, like what some, what people don't understand, like, and I hope this doesn't offend anyone, but shooting women's easy. Like you can make, like, I tell everyone this too. Like you could take any shape size of a woman and make her hot. You can't make a fat guy hot. <laughs> <laughs> so the rules are different. Like, like when you're shooting practice stuff, you know, a guy, the standard for a guy is a, is completely different than it is for a girl so you have a girl who has a really pretty face but maybe she's chubby well you make her voluptuous you know you move that hip away pull that shoulder down you know she's curvy and gorgeous you can't do that with a guy i mean it, it don't work that way do you think it's like our perception in society or do you th like literal just like physical makeup and structure? physical makeup yeah because you know there there's still uh you know, we, we still have ideas, masculine ideas and feminine ideas. And I don't give a shit who you are. Like, you know, when you when you're think as you know, when you're thinking masculine, you're thinking hard and chiseled and, and tough. When you're thinking feminine, you know, it's softer, it's more round. Well, you know, I like to consider myself a pretty manly dude, but I mean I'm never going to be a model. You're never going to shoot me. I'm too fucking fat. <laughs> you know, that's never going to happen. Yeah. You know, and so the standards are, are vastly different for shooting guys than it is girls. And so finding guys to shoot is like a needle in a haystack. Like it is very hard. And then, and, and for me, the same way with girls, you know, and I'm kind of jumping all over the place, but I told, I told a story to one of my friends the other day, um, so when I first got in photography, one of the websites that I followed a lot was 500 Pixels. Have you ever heard of that? Uh -huh. So 500 Pixels, you know, you go and you post your pictures on there and they're from all over the world and people, you know, vote for them and rank them. And patting myself on the back, I had two at number one so far. <laughs> and I haven't done it for a long time, but anyway. So, you know, there's where I get a lot of my information. My inspiration was from 500 Pixels. And then maybe about three or four years into things, this dude named Jens from Germany wrote me and he goes, what's your nationality? And I said, I'm American. And he goes, you are? And I go, yeah. He goes, I wouldn't have thought you were American by what you shoot and how you shoot. And I go, well, what do you think I was? He said, I would have thought you as a Czech or, or, you know, an East German or Russian. And, and then I, I never really thought about it. And then I started thinking about the pictures that I was drawn to on 500 pixels and the artist. That, and I still say it. I think the best portraits artists in the world come from those, that side of the world. Like we have great portraits artists here in America, but not like over there. Uh, and cause the portraits are a lot different for, especially for women. Um, over here, it's very bubble gummy, you know, a lot of TNA, this, that cute girls over there, beautiful, more exotic 
hard chisel, completely different looking, completely different lighting. Um, and so that's what I was drawn to. And so it all made sense when he said that, that, yeah, I guess so that, and that's where my style comes from. I shoot super contrasty, um, you know, one light specifically, and it's all, I think a lot of it comes from seeing those artists and their pictures on 500 pixels. Yeah. It kind of bled over and inspired your work in some way. Yeah. And I, and I don't like, I'm not, I don't shoot cute people from, and just portfolio work. I mean, Regular clients, totally different thing. But just like as far as portfolio work goes, cute girls do nothing for me. Like I could care less because they're just a cute girl. What, who gives a shit? Um, you know, I'm looking for interesting people. Uh, unique people are super exotic. And then with guys, I mean, I make no bones about it. I get a lot of people. Like I get all the time people send me pictures. Oh, I got this person. You should shoot them. Oh, which is really interesting to me. Uh, I cannot believe – like. You know, that whole beauty's in the eye of the beholder mm -hmm. is the most true thing in the entire world <laughs> because what people send to me is people they think I should shoot. I'm just like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, I, I don't understand what you think. It's <laughs> what gonna, you're seeing what there. You're seeing because, but with guys, like I say, you know, if you don't look like David Beckham, I don't want to shoot you. Yeah. And it's, you know, I, I want to shoot a man, like a chiseled man, you know, no body fat, like, and that's, for me, what I would want to shoot, you know. How has, um, like, because you said in the beginning, right, you used to think, God, I was so fucking, I, I was so good. And I look back at my work and fuck, I was killing it. And and now, like, what was that progression like to, at what point? Because as you were saying that, it made me think about, like, an earlier thing where it was like, you know, you're 20 years old and you think you know everything. And then you look back and you're like, fuck, I was an idiot. Like, what was that progression like where... How did, how do you think that changed your work in a sense when you suddenly had the realization of like, fuck, I got to throw everything out. Cause I really, you not, not that you're getting rid of it, but you just realized how much you didn't know. Right. Yeah. I think, I mean, for me, it was, it was lighting patterns and I, I couldn't tell you when I found them or not. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm such a humongous proponent of lighting patterns. Uh, because break it down for people that have no fucking idea what you're talking about. Well, okay. Like a so, lighting pattern. So you're lighting. So, so there's, there's, so your lighting patterns, you have Rembrandt and you have rim and you have split and you have loop and you have butterfly. Um, I'm sure I'm missing one. Uh, um, anyway. Uh, and so basically the best way I can describe it, and I've said it a million times too, it's like those those lighting patterns will give you your mood and those lighting patterns will dictate what your picture looks like and your, and your subject will dictate what those patterns you can use. So like, so split light, which is basically you're splitting a person in half. So one half is in darkness and one half is in light. Well, if you're going to use that pattern in general, there's, you would use it for one reason and that's for drama because one half is dark and one half is light. Uh, and so in that, the, uh, so then like if I wanted to do something that was more like proper and stoic, I would shoot Rembrandt pattern because it's, you know, you still have half shade, but then you have light, you know, coming onto the one side and it's just, it's a, it's just a, a great proper pattern. If you want to, you know, shoot someone and, and you want all their eyes lit up and you want it nice and soft and even light, to me, the best pattern for that is loop light because it gets it everywhere, but you still have enough contrast on the side to give you depth. You know, uh, if you, you know, for fashion-y kind of stuff or, or you want more of a bright situation or you have crappy skin or crappy facial features, for me, that's when you're going to butterfly light them you know get that light above them but it's still steep enough to where you still get some of that contrast you know and and even though flat light really isn't a pattern there's times when you're going to completely flat light someone like you like even though it's a no-no you're going to say well i want <clears throat> it to look like x so i'm going to light it that way and so for me once i found those lighting patterns it was kind of going back a little bit the way i shoot I shoot by organization. And what I mean by that is, is 
So let's say I'm going to take your portrait and we've already met. I have all my criteria in my head. Now I have to create what I'm going to create. So the first thing in my head is I'm going to think, okay, what's going to be my F-stop? You know, do I want shallow depth of field or do I want, you know, everything super in focus? That's my first choice in my head. So let's say more for guys, I'm not going to go shallow depth of field. So I know, okay, so I'm probably going to shoot you at F11. So at F11 now becomes a choice of my lens. So what lens do I want to shoot you at F11 that I like the most? My first go-to for me is my, my 105. Because my 105 is super sharp at F11. It, 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 uh, um, it uh, compresses things super nicely. I could shoot my, my 70 to 200, but, but I'm going to shoot a prime because I think it's sharper in studio. So I'm going to shoot that 105. Maybe I wanted to stay, if I was going to open up, if I'm going to open you up, it's going to be a little bit different. So I'm not going to shoot a 2.8 lens. So then my choices are my 85, my 50, my 58. And so depending on how I want to distort your head or keep it straight, like if I want distortion and not really a true portrait, then I'm going to shoot you with my 50. If I want more of a true portrait, but I want it more open to be able to shoot at the one twos, I'm going to shoot you with my 58 or my 85. So then we have those two thoughts. So now that I have my, I have my depth of field and I have the lens I'm going to do it with. Now it becomes a matter of the pattern. What's my mood? You know, do I want like a, a, a corporate headshot type thing? So then I'm just going to probably loop light you. Or if it's a guy, broad light, I don't really short light anybody. I'm not a big short lighter. Um, Maybe it's someone with bad skin, so now I'm going to loop light that way. But maybe I want to make it more edgy, so I'm going to Rembrandt you. So now that I figured out what my light's going to be and my pattern I want to use, the next thing I'm going to think is, okay, what modifier am I going to use to make the best results that I want? You know, if it's if it's going to be more bright, do I want to use like do I want super softness? Then maybe I'll use a, a four by six or a three by four softbox. But if I want that light a little more specular, then maybe I'm going to pull out my SETI, my 28-inch beauty dish. If I want a little tighter, maybe I pull out my ray on my 16-inch beauty dish. You know, then maybe I want super hard light, so I'm just going to bring out my magnum reflector and shoot you with that. So now I have that stuff in my head. So now this is what's building all the pictures. So now I have the focal length, the f-stop. I have the lens I'm going to use, I have the modifier I'm going to use. Now it comes a matter of, okay, what did they wear? Like everything that I do, I try to stay pretty uh, in the same tonal range. So if you brought in um, earth tone clothes, I'd probably use an earth tone backdrop. If you, you know, d you know, I'll shoot on white or I'll shoot on black. <clears throat> so then it becomes like, I'm going to shoot you on gray. Well, how gray? You know, I know now if I got you right next to the, right next to the backdrop, then your the gray is going to be bright. If I want more, I got to move you away. So, all these things, like we talking about constructing this thing, these are all the things that are cranking in my head, that's building this portrait of you. And so, then do we come into the posing part of it? You know, if it's a tight headshot, am I going to shoot you straight on? Maybe I'm going to turn your shoulders a little way and bring your neck if you're if you're an older person, that sucks because if I try to turn you and bring your neck around, we get these fucking folds in your neck. So I got to shoot you a little more straight on or I got to fix those crazy folds. Maybe you're someone that has a double chin. So I want to keep you straight on, poke that chin down, you know, poke it out and down, you know. So like I said, all these, there's all those things that go into building that, that picture in the end. And that just comes with practice and knowledge of your equipment. So if we go back, because <laughs> I've listened to you, you were shooting for eight years, you said you didn't pick up a fucking camera until you're 40 years old. 40. So if we go back and we let 40-year-old Craig listen to that conversation that you just had, the way you just fucking broke that down, what the hell would he think? He wouldn't even know what the fuck I'm talking <laughs> like, about. What is this man talking he, about? He used to go, uh, <laughs> what? You know, and I even think, and, and see, and that's the other sad part about it is, I mean, at least 80% of so-called professional photographers out there wouldn't understand that. Yeah. That wouldn't even be a, and I'm not, and I'm not saying that that's wrong because the other cool thing about photography is there's a million ways to skin a cat. The way I describe that is my process. Someone else may have a vastly, well, you know, 
you know, a lot of people, they don't, they don't put that much thought into it and they take perfectly fine pictures. Like some people would just always use a four by six because that look they have is always light and airy. I think when, when all this stuff comes into play is, is when you start to become more diverse. Uh, I think one of the really sad things about photography too is, is we get told all the time that you have to specialize. You know, I'm a, I'm a wedding shooter. I'm a portrait shooter. I'm a corporate headshot shooter. You know, I'm a natural light shooter. I'm a this. You know, I think for me, it's super sad because if you only can shoot a certain way, when it comes to business, you're in trouble because let's say that all I do is shoot light and airy and I have someone come to me that's going to pay me a bunch of money that says, hey, I want it to look like this. And this is very contrasty and you have to be able to understand how to how to use rim light, how to do this, how to do that. If you don't know how, you have to say bye bye to those dollars. Yeah. You know, if you're if you're a real contrasty shooter and don't really understand you know, other things, then you're going to have to pass on those type of things. And for me, you know, the, you know, there's no such thing as the greatest artist in the world. Like it doesn't exist because it's so subjective. But what I will say about myself is I got to be one of the most versatile photographers on planet earth because I can shoot every single thing and I can shoot it all really, really well. And I can shoot natural light or strobe lights or constant lights or this, that, or like there isn't anything that I can't shoot. But it's because I've practiced and practiced and practiced with everything that you could. And and for me, that's the thrill of photography. You know, the thrill of photography is being able to do anything. Like, Like the greatest joy in life is to have, be able to take what's in here in your head and bring it to life. And I think that's where a lot of frustration comes from and mediocrity comes from is when you have someone creative, but they don't have the technical structure to be creative. Like that's all fine and dandy and all the, oh, this is my art, this is my art. But, you know, if you're if you're a chef and all your food tastes like shit, does that mean, are you really a chef or are you just throwing <laughs> shit together? Yeah. No different than a photographer. Like, are you really a true professional photographer if you can't get out what's here to the world? And, you know, I, I say this a lot too. Like, you don't have to shoot everything, but you better be able to shoot everything. And and that's what pushes me. That's a, That's my drive is that I never, ever want to be in a situation where someone wants me to do X and I have to bow out. Or even worse, which happens in most cases, people agree to do things that they're not capable of doing and fuck it up. Yeah. Why did you stop teaching? Like, why did you pull back from that space? Um, I call it Barry Sanders. <laughs> so if everyone don't know who Barry Sanders is, Barry Sanders is one of the greatest running backs in the history of the world. And Barry left when he was still at his best. And forever and ever and ever and ever, people are going to always go... Fuck, man, how good could have Barry been? And you could never answer that because he left. And it's kind of like that. Like, when I when I left, um, when, when I quit coaching football, the last game I ever coached, we were undefeated and won our state championship. Like, it doesn't get better than that. And I would never go back because you could, never, you could only equal that. You could never better it. And 99% chances you're going to worse, you know, do that worse. And so... You know, like with teaching, you know, I felt like I was, I was pretty, I was on my game pretty well. And I spoke at all the major things. And I was really scared that, like, I wanted to leave before I got asked to leave. You know, and the other thing was that, you know, in this business, you are either a photographer, studio owner, or you're a teacher. And it's very, very, very rare that you can be both. And the ones, you know, there's a lot of people in our business that blow smoke up your dress and they're so fucking full of shit. You know, there's so many educators out there who will tell you how to run your studio and ain't been a fucking studio in 20 years. They tell you how to be successful and do all this shit and all they do is fucking talk, you know. And I didn't want to be that. And, you know, I didn't, I did not leave what I was doing to be an educator. I left what I was doing to be a photographer. And that's not to say I won't teach again because I'll teach here and there. And and I love teaching. Like 
I I loved it so much um, because it was it was coaching. I can hear it. I can hear it in your voice, right? Like you, when you start talking about the craft and the art and the process, that's your process, and you're sharing it with fucking people. Like you get lit up. Like that's your passion. You can feel that. And so in my mind, I'm sitting there thinking, like, you know, I love photography. I consider myself like a uh, a shitty amateur photographer, <laughs> but I enjoy it. Right? I enjoy the craft of it, and I just have fun with it. But for me, like, I would love to just sit and fucking listen to you teach. I would love to sit and glean what little bit and piece I could from you simply because I can feel all the passion that you have behind it. And those are the type of people that I think people are drawn to, right? Somebody could sit and teach me something that I'm not interested at all in, but if they're passionate about it and if you can feel that passion, then, I'm, you know, I'm going to enjoy that. I'm going to get something from it. Well, I definitely, you know, I, I definitely <laughs> love it. I just, I just needed a break too. Yeah. You know, um, and I also think that the the teaching market, you know, I got no problem with competition. I have no problem with people. I mean, that's the great part about America. You can be whatever you want. But I think that the the workshop arena, you know, it comes down to economics, a lot of it too. Like like people aren't there's 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 legitimately so much phenomenal free information out there that you know, in order to make the economics of the time and the investment uh, worth it, it's very hard these days. Like, you have to be a big monster to make this workshop business work anymore, I think. Like, you got to be like a Sue Bryce or, or you know, someone in that caliber, you know, Lindsay Adler or Emily Soto or someone like that because you're going to have to draw big numbers to make it worth your time. Mm -hmm. And I'll... You know, one of the things I'd never done here in Pocatello is since I started, like I told you, I, I which was kind of bad, I, I didn't really need income from photography. And so I never really pursued my market here like I should have. And so to me, like I said, I've, I've reached all the goals that I wanted to reach in, in the teaching world and speaking world. But I'd, I'd never accomplished all the things I wanted to accomplish in my own market. Like, it's really funny. Like, my favorite thing that happens is once a year they have this thing called the reader's poll. And every year I think I, I'm fourth or fifth best studio in Pocatello, Idaho. And it's and two people or three don't even have studios, I think. <laughs> so, so... Every year, it's, I, I, it's my favorite thing because I just think, well, you know, and it was this way for a long time. Like, I'm more known throughout the world because of social media and stuff than I am in my own town. Yeah. Like, people here don't even know the studio exists, and that's 100% my fault. And so part of pulling back, too, was, as uh, you know, I just want travel now. Like, I'm at a point in my life where... You know, I don't, I don't want a big fancy house. I don't want big fancy cars. Like, I just want to see the world with, with the time I have left. And um, so, and that's just making money. Like, you can't go do all those things without making money. And really, you don't make a lot of money teaching in workshops. Like, it's more about making really great relationships and contacts and getting some free stuff and getting some pats on the back. And that's great and all. And I can't say that, I mean, I was a, I was a speaking convention whore. Like, like I loved it but it didn't pay any bills. You know, I got some stuff. Yeah. But there's way more money in running your studio. And so that's kind of where my focus is now because like, I just I just want to see the world and travel and shoot it. And I'm not going to accomplish that teaching and speaking at, at conferences. Like, it don't work that way. So, like, now when you travel, like, I know that because uh, just recently was it, you were in Italy. Is that right? Yeah. Like, is that the type of thing where you're just like, fuck, I want to go to Italy and shoot? And then you just go, or is it? I want to go to Italy and eat. <laughs> <laughs> Take my camera with me on the side. Uh, yeah. So one of the things I haven't done as well as I should, I've done so many things. I, dude, I, I do such such <laughs> things ass backwards all the time. But I'm, I'm lucky and super blessed enough to be in a position where there probably isn't a place on earth that if I was going, I can't get on social media and say, hey, I'm coming here. Could someone show me around? What, do you want to do a photo shoot, do something like that? And so for a lot of time I was traveling and not doing that. And I'd come back and go, God, what a dumbass. Like who who has the ability to go to all these places and do for do what you do and be able to build a cool portfolio like I'm able to do. And so 
when I do travel, part of it is I want to see things and, and have my Anthony Bourdain experiences. But the other thing is I want to shoot because I, I do want to, uh, I, I want to leave kind of a record of, of where I've been and the things that I've done, you know, we're as photographers or as artists, I guess in general, you know, whether you make music or write music or you create pictures or paintings or whatever, we're super lucky in the fact that we can create a actual real legacy that will by far outlive us. Like, like when I'm gone, my pictures will live on. Like I know they will, like, like they'll be floating around here, there, or this, that, or the other. And so that's kind of part of it too. Like, I just want to, I want to shoot stuff that, that will outlive me, you know, and, and just have fun. Are you having fun? Oh yeah, man. Like <laughs> Italy was amazing. Like Italy really, Italy was the first time that I'd ever like, um, so my friend Alessandra, she was from Naples. And so I went down and saw her, she was there with her kids and her family. And she took me all over Naples and we shot all over Naples and created these amazing images. And we went to local eating places and, and it was so much different than I'd ever experienced. And so, you know, that's how I want to travel from now on. Um, you know, I want to travel. I just wanted to be gritty. Like before I was 40, you know, I hadn't been places, but when we would go places, you know, we, we really went pretty high in a hog because Stacy did well and I did well. Um, but that's not like what I want to do. Like I want to stay in hostels. I want to, I want to meet people. I want to hear their stories. You know, I want to feel that kindred spirit of, of travelers and artists and those kind of things. Do you think you're a different guy than you were 10 years ago? <sighs> Nine day. And do you think that that has come like just in the natural progression of what your life is or kind of in conjunction with, cause I think the, for me personally, I think when people can tap into the creative side of what they are, whatever that looks like, right. Whether it's photography, whether it's actual painting, whether it's woodwork, it doesn't fucking matter how it manifests in you. But when you can tap into that creative side of yourself and kind of connect into that space, I think that's when things start to open up because it opens up different pathways in your brain and, the, and in reality even. Right. So do you think it came in conjunction with this or would you have eventually gotten to kind of where you physically feel you're at in your life now had you not had Dude, no. this fucking outlet? No. My, if I had not have bought that camera at that Costco, my life would be so different. I mean, it would have been, I mean, it's like this. If all you ever watch is black and white TV, you don't know how great color TV is until you see color TV and go, fuck, I can never go back to black and white. So I couldn't say that if I hadn't got that camera, my, my life, I've always had fun in my life and I've had great adventures and done different things and it would have been fine, but it wouldn't have been what it is. And it would have been a, a crime for me if I would have never found this part of it. And it's all due to that camera. Like I would have not seen the world without that camera. You know, I wouldn't even have had to, you know, when I was in insurance, all I wanted to do was like, I told you about these little movies and these fantasies I have in my life. Like I, I really legitimately thought I was going to make the senior PGA tour because I would, I mean, I, I'm very obsessive compulsive. So I would be on a golf course before the clubhouse opened and got a round in and I'd jump on with some, I'd play three rounds Saturday and Sunday at each day. And that's all I cared about football and golf and going to Vegas and gambling and fucking off with my friends. And since that camera, you know, opened me up to meeting all these amazing people and seeing cultures, you know, I've always been kind of a foodie, but, more so now um but yeah i would i would have never I, even the outdoor stuff like one of the things that my ex-wife and i talk about sometimes is you know we were so different in things like she had seven horses and she always wanted to ride her horses and go hiking and all this kind of stuff and i was never down for that kind of stuff you know it was football and golf and then once we got divorced and i got more into the world like i i I go hiking all the time. I go paddleboarding all over the place. And, I, and you know, jokingly, she's like, where the hell was this guy? <laughs> now, where is this fucking dude? Yeah. You know, all those, I go, he didn't exist, you know? And, and so not just seeing other parts of the world, but enjoying like our area. Like we live in an amazing place here. 
like within two hours is some of the most beautiful country in the entire world. And I'd never even seen it until I started going out even just like a month ago to say, I'm going to go hiking in the Tetons and paddle boarding in Jackson Hole. And so, and that all comes from, that all comes from the camera because the other thing the camera did for me is like I told you before, I see things. That's one of the things that I think that, you know, I told you before, everything's been shot. Every location has been shot unless they build something new. Every pose has been done. But what makes you a great artist or a unique artist is how you see the things that exist. And that's one of the things that I'm really, 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 really good at is seeing things. Seeing things in a way that is appealing to people. Because that's one of the things I know is that the things that I create speak to a lot of people or I wouldn't have the um, support that I have from people from everywhere because people do enjoy what I create and I'm able to, you know, I get, does that make sense? For sure. Like, and so, and so even when I'm out in nature, I'm able to see the world and I wouldn't have been able to see that. I wouldn't have, I would never in a million years if it hadn't been for the camera. Like when I went to Italy, I went to, uh, so I went to the Sistine Chapel and this is one totally completely off things. When you go and you go to like these big monuments, take a tour because you're doing yourself a disservice because the tour guide knows way more than you know, and you will never appreciate things without having some backstory, at least in my opinion. So like we went to the Sistine Chapel, our tour guide was telling us how we created this thing and how we had to use all this crazy geometry to figure out how to paint it because it was round to make it look like this. So, I mean, they go through all this mathematical equations. He had to lay out and plot out. Then when you go in a Sistine Chapel, you look at the art and it's great, but it's not like, I mean, I wasn't blown away by the actual technical painting. Like it's cool and he's a great artist, but unless I had that backstory about how and why did he was, I could never appreciate that thing the way it was. And I thought it was okay. So then you get done in Sistine Chapel and you go into St. Peter's Basilica and it fucking blew my mind. Like, um, I get real emotional about it. Um, is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Like, I mean, first off, the Basilica is humongous and it's so ornate and gorgeous and detailed. And, and I'm just thinking, oh my gosh, how could people create what they did with the technology that they had? And it just like, and if I hadn't picked up that camera, it would have been cool and I would have appreciated it. But being an artist, going, holy shit, I know what I do. I take pretty pictures, but this is so far beyond me that, that it's just that that I, it amazes me, I guess, is the only way I could put it. And I couldn't have that amazement fully if I, if I wasn't, uh, for, you know, if I wasn't the artist I am because I know how hard I work to do what I do. What I do ain't even fucking close to what those dudes did. You know what I mean? And so to answer your question, yeah, I mean... The camera's everything, man. That camera, people search their whole life to, um, um, like, um, you know, with the teaching and traveling, I meet a million people. And it's so crazy how many people in the world have no idea why they're here or what their purpose is or what they were supposed to become. And like, I know, you know, like, you know, I'm supposed to be a photographer and I am, you know, big baby but <laughs> when you were talking <clears throat> back at the beginning we were talking about um loneliness and uh 
how people crave connection, right? And how the guy that may seem like he has it all and has all, you know, all of these friends and all of this lifestyle and things like that, at the end of the day, he's lonely. And it reminded me, and it's something that I hadn't thought about in a while, but I believe that, you know, the big grand scheme of things, the question of why the fuck we're here and what this thing is all about. Um, I think for me, at least one piece of it, one answer, and it's a big chunk of it is human connection is just this simple fact of we need each other, not just in the literal sense of like, I need your help, you know, doing X, Y, or Z, but just the connection that you get from people, um, I think is a big reason why we exist because we crave it, we need it, but then we also have the opportunity to give it. And it's that exchange that takes place. And I think that's, you know, a big reason why whatever the fuck this whole experience of life in this world and this planet and whatever may be, I think that's a big chunk of it is that human connection. And I love, cause from the sounds of it, like, you know, the camera and your work and this path that your life took because a Costco opened up in your fucking town. Yeah. Uh, in some way, shape or form allowed you to not just see that connection in people, but then also to kind of, you know, give you that connection as well, right? Because you're bringing that to to the table as well. The people that you shoot, the people that you work with, undoubtedly get that exchange with you as well, man. And I think it comes across. Well, thank you. And I'm blessed. Like, um, I'm really blessed. You know, sometimes you sometimes you take it for granted, you know, and, and I have to catch myself with that, you know, too. That, like, you know, what we do is really important. I, and I never really realized that until, like, you, you know, everyone says the same thing when someone passes. Like, man, I wish I had a picture of grandma. I wish I, you know, I tell, you know, I, I've never actually said this. But one day when I'm really feeling super cocky and ballsy and don't care, I'm, I'm going to slap it on some family that gives me a lot of shit about pricing especially. Is that, you know, when people box, say, oh, my gosh, this costs so much. So, okay, yeah, it's a little bit of an investment. That's true. No, but let's say we took that picture and. And let's say someone in that picture wasn't around the next day. What would that picture be worth? And they're like, well, it'd be priceless. I go, well, I'm going to fucking wait and sell it to you when it's priceless then. <laughs> I'll take yeah. it down, but I'll let you buy it when it's priceless. Yeah. And, you know, I, I just, I, I, I never really realized how important having a visual record really is. You know, I mean, it, and I don't care, you know. Yeah, I want people to come to me. You know, obviously I want to make a living, you know, but I think, you know, if you don't come to me, go to someone else. You know, that's one of the cool things about photography is um, there's a photographer for everybody. You know, you know, as a photographer, as a business owner, you have to kind of decide what you're going to be. And I, I think that there's three three kinds. There's the volume guys that make a lot of money shooting real fast like like my friend matthew uh matthew the body in minneapolis you know he he has a phenomenal studio you know just murders it but he but he does a lot of schools and stuff so they make their money on volume you know he says if i can get like twenty dollars a person but when you're shooting four thousand people you're okay you know and then there's the higher end people you know who really they have a name and they they, they can name their price for their art you know, and then there's that level. And I think the people who get in a lot of trouble are that medium people. You know, the people whose work really isn't any different than anybody else's. And when your work really isn't any different and your experience isn't any different, then you only have one thing you can negotiate, and that's the price. And that's what I think most people get beat up on is like, and, you know, I still get beat up on that stuff. I mean, I mean, another thing in photography that's kind of, that I don't particularly like either is um, there's so many people telling you how to run your business. You know, oh, if you, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Uh, people, uh, you know, these professional photographers who bitch about people selling discs. Well, that's the world we live in, you know, and you can, you can, I, I know, I personally know at least three or four photographers who took that, drew that line in the sand and they're not photographers anymore, you know, cause that's not our world. And so, I think that, you know, there's there's a client for everybody. And so don't be dissuaded 
by having people tell you how you should run your business, you know, how to pay your bills, that you're doing it the wrong way. As long as you're not ripping people off and you're being honest, sell a disc, you know, don't charge a session fee, sell your pictures for $10 a piece. What do I care? You know, you, what you do doesn't affect me, you know, and, and a lot of photographers out there to say, well, those people are killing our business and devaluing it. Well, you know, it, it's up to us as business owners to set our value, you know, to by how we market, uh, by, by our perceptions that we give out there. It's up to us to, to put the value of what we do out to the world. And if you're not getting that value, then that's your fault. It's not because your neighbor is selling it for less. You know, I mean, it, that's going to happen. There's price shoppers out there, you know, but that's just, that's the way of the world. I'm, you know, I'm a price shopper. I'm not going to go. I, I go TJ Ross and Max are my favorite places because <laughs> I'm never, ever in my lifetime going to go to, to like uh, Saks Fifth Avenue and buy me a pair of jeans for $200. That's never going to happen because I don't value it that way. And so it's up to them to find the customers that value that, just like it's up to me to find my clients who value what I do at the price that I do, not me to worry about what the other guy's doing. Yeah. Craig, I love you, man. I'm so glad I got to come up and chat with you. Well, thank you. It's been so wonderful. I hope you got something out of it. My gosh. <laughs> no, it's absolutely wonderful, man. I'm very, very, uh, I love the opportunity. I was driving up here today and I was thinking like, I just love the fact that I get to find people that I want to talk to. And now I have a reason, right? I remember talking to somebody not long ago where it's like, if I was out of the blue just to reach out to Craig and be like, hey, I want to come up and like have coffee with you and be like, who the fuck is this guy that just wants to come up and hang out for an hour and a half and bullshit? I don't know this fucking guy, right? He's a stranger. I'm not going to hang out with him and chat with him for an hour and a half, but I have an excuse now where I meet people, I find people, I follow people, I see stuff out in the world and I want to be able to uh, learn more about that person. I would say this though. If someone did, you know... I think, I think, so, you know, I think whoever, so when you're at a certain place in this photography world and you do have a lot of people that do follow you and are very appreciative of you, I, for me, like, if someone did just say that, and please don't everyone do this, please, because <laughs> I, I have to run my business, but being honest, like, if someone was coming from a ways away and they just say, hey, and I've had it happen, I'll, more times you would think here, you know, people traveling to this, because you have to go past this place to get to the, hold. you're good. Oh, upstairs. Did you want us to meet you at one or not there, sunshine? <laughs> oh, come up here for one second. Who is this? <laughs> oh, I'm, oh, yes. So, hold on one second. We're just finishing up one little thing. You're very good. We'll be downstairs. Okay. My bad. <laughs> um, uh, oh, going back to what I was saying, you know, I've had people, you know, because you have to go through the state parks yeah. or go past here to get anywhere. You know, I have people call me and say, hey, we're passing through. Are you going to be at your studio? I'd love to meet you. You know, and, and I try to go out of my way best I can to, to give someone 10 minutes, you know, because the, the God's honest truth is if it wasn't for all those people out there in the wild world who follow me or who, you know, go to the different conferences and come to the places I'm speaking and do all those things, I'll fucking be nothing, you know? And, and so I think it's, I think it's really crappy if, if people that are kind of in the position that I'm in can't take a little bit of the time out of their life to, to meet people who really appreciate what they do. Yeah. You know, I, I think it's important because I, I, I think that's one of the things that really scare me the most is to I never want someone to meet me who thought that they knew me because I'm so accessible online and then meet me and go, man, he's a dick. <laughs> like he, he, that's not, he's a phony, you know? And, and I think about that a lot because I mean, truth be told, there's, there's, you know, there's some photographers out there who that's how it happens. Yeah. We've yeah. all met people like that before. Yeah. And, and I don't want to be that person because, you know, like I said, I think it's important that if someone's, if someone's going to support you and do that and all they're asking for is a couple minutes of your time or something and you, 
and you can do it, you know, I, I think it's but only if you don't do it. And so I get to tell everyone I'm, I really am so appreciative of, of everybody out there. You know, everyone who likes one of my pictures or everybody who comments on a picture or everyone who sees me somewhere and just comes up and shakes my hand and says hi or says something nice about what it is I do that, that I appreciate that more than, than they'll ever know, you yeah. know, because, I mean, I'm, I'm just lucky. I'm blessed, man. Well, I'm blessed. I'm glad I got a time with you, man. It sounds like you got some work downstairs you got to go take care oh, yeah, of. Yeah, I didn't know. <laughs> Real quick, what's the best way for people to find your shit, follow you? Uh, well, if things don't pick up, they'll probably see me at my Walmart reading them <laughs> here pretty soon. Uh, no, just, uh, uh, just on Facebook. Facebook or Instagram. Just uh, Craig Lemaire on Facebook. Or I think my Instagram's Craig Lemaire. Sweet. I, we'll it, put it in the show notes so people can find it. Too, oh, but. yeah. Yeah, that's the best way. Yeah. Thank you, man. I appreciate okay, it. Okay, thank you. You know, just because you own a camera doesn't make you a professional photographer. Just because someone bought your shitty, ugly pictures doesn't make you a professional photographer. You know, you can have everything in the world, but if you don't have anyone to share it with, there's no point to it. I don't know if I'm a perfectionist, but I do everything to win, to be the very best I want to shoot stuff that, that will outlive me, you know, and, and just have fun.